Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, imagine that at the entrance, uh, we would have asked to, to make a full body scan, make a 3D scan of your body, and then subsequently make a perfect chair for you, so that you would perfectly sit right through these presentations. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. So yeah, I'm uh, Jasper Baumeister. Um, I'm uh, founder of a startup here in Zwolle, Fibernearing. Uh, we're based at the Polymer Science Park. Maybe you, uh, you heard, heard of that. And I'm actually here to tell you that uh, 3D printing chairs, I don't think that's really a good uh, solution. It's not a good use of material. It doesn't, it's not going to, to help us a lot. But I do think, and, and I'm very enthusiastic about new technologies, and I do think there's a lot of potential in using new technologies to shape the future. We just had a brilliant talk about uh, cars and mobility, uh, and, and it's very obvious that technology is, is a great importance for making the future of mob uh, mobility work. Durability, um, the, the, the climate change, those kind of things, technology is going to help that as well. Um, and the last, uh, last one, which, uh, or a uh, last one, is for example, uh, population increase. Those are all uh, questions, big questions for the future, where I think technology is going to play a big role. And I, th I think uh, 3D printing is going to be a little bit in that. It's going to help a little bit. So what I want to do today is talk about uh, what we are doing in Zwolle, what kind of cool things are happening with 3D printing, what is possible, where it helps uh, on, on climate change and, and uh, mobility, and, and what, yeah, what we can do with it. So when you talk about 3D printing, most people know these kind of things. So they're very nice little uh, printers. It's actually a Dutch company that's doing very well with these, uh, these kind of printers. And you can make very nice little bits and pieces with it. So they're used a lot in classrooms, they're a lot of with, with home enthusiasts. I don't know, has anyone uh, got a printer at home? Yeah, look, there's, there's probably three, four people in the room here. And you can do very nice things. So, for example, this is a thing a student uh, of us uh, printed. Uh, so it's a very nice robot hand. It's very cool. Um, you can make these kind of things. It's, it's a nice little skull, and uh, you can, uh, you can make, it, make it a study object. Those kind of things are possible with these kind of printers. And how it works is actually quite simple. There's a, a, a head that uh, melts a thermoplastic material, a polymer, and puts it at the right place where you want it. And it goes around and around and builds up the structure from, the, from scratch. The beauty is all the materials you want to uh, use end up in the product. Um, but the, the, the drawback of this technology is actually that you melt material on top of other material and it's actually relatively weak. So it's, it's perfect for making parts that you want to show to people, but it's not very great for parts that you actually want to use in a technical sense. So these parts are not very strong. So industrially, there's a lot uh, of demand for real technical uh, applications uh, built on 3D printing. And this is actually our uh, printer we built, and this is a real industrial uh, printer. So in comparison on the, the Ultimaker I showed before, you can print these kind of objects. What we can do here, we can go up to a meter scale. So we can make very big um, products. The other thing is that the products are made in a different fashion. So you can make uh, very, uh, very strong products. Industrially, there's a lot of attention on 3D printing. So if you look to the aircraft manufacturers, they are actually investigating 3D printing since, since years now. And what they are doing, for example, is they're printing engine parts. Uh, it's an example that you hear quite often. Because the cooling channels in these engine parts are so small and so little, you can make it in 3D printing and you cannot make it in any other way. So it's very efficient, it's very effective to use 3D printing in that way. Another example of an in industrial use is uh, a Dutch shipbuilder who announced a few, uh, few months ago that they're going to produce complete ship propellers out of 3D printed material. The beauty of that is that you uh, use all the material effectively rather than starting with a big block of material and, and removing material uh, just for wasting it. So, uh, one of the examples we, uh, we have, so this is something we produce here in Zwolle. Uh, this is a 3D printed photothesis. So what it is, people that uh, can't 
actually control their, uh, their ankle, uh, currently get these kind of things. And they're, they're currently already made out of fiber reinforced materials. But we have developed a method using that printer uh, where we can produce these kind of products. And they're fit for, uh, for every customer, so the patient gets the right product. And the beauty is that the, the, the time to get to the product is a lot shorter than in traditional methods. So therefore, the patient is, is, is a lot uh, better off. He has, a, or he or she, has a product that's much better suited, and there's, no, uh, there's not a lot of hassle in getting towards the product. But don't get me wrong, there's, there's a lot still to develop in the, in the 3D printing world, because currently all traditional methods they are so well established that everything is standardized, everything is fully specified, and it's very difficult to do or to achieve the same level with 3D printing. So there's still a lot of research to be done. But I think these examples show that material properties-wise, we are able to match the current materials. And then the second thing I want to talk about is production volumes. So if you look at current uh, production methods, uh, a, a typical example, that you could compare to is injection molding or spuitgieten in, uh, in Dutch. Uh, injection molding is a, is a production method which is used very extensively in industry. So a lot of the products you use in your daily life are made in injection molding. And it's actually a very simple process to understand. So what happens, this is an injection molding machi machine. On the right hand side, the material is melted and it's uh, pressurized. On the left hand side, there is a steel mold in this case. Um, and the mold cavity is filled with a liquid polymer uh, because the mold is a lot cooler, the, the polymer solidifies again, the mold opens and the product is finished. And then the mold closes again and you get the next cycle. This is a very productive process. Uh, you can make very, very large amounts of products with this process. But the thing is that the molds are ridiculously expensive. There's some very nice cars outside um, probably these molds, they cost pretty much the same as, uh, as one of those cars. So you can imagine that if you want to make a small number of products, that's actually quite unfavorable using this kind of technique. But there's a lot of instances where you want to use smaller series of products. If you think, for example, uh, if you want to launch a new product, but you're not yet sure if it's going to fly or not, um, same intern that, uh, that really liked uh, 3D printing started uh, a year ago with these kind of things. I don't know if you know them. If you have kids, you probably know them. Uh, the fidget spinners. Last two, three months, they're really hyping here in the Netherlands. Uh, he found them a year ago on the internet uh, on Thingiverse. He printed one of them. He was playing around with it. And um, so in, in that sense, you, you could try maybe making 100, making 200 of those fidget spinners give them out, see if people like them, and then you can start real production. And then you can be really at the front of the hype cycle with these kind of things. Secondly, uh, customization is, a, is, is, is an area where you would require smaller numbers. So if you have a complete production cycle, you need to sell the same product to everybody. You can maybe change the color, but that's it. So you need to, change, you need to sell the same product to you, to you, to you, to you. And currently, people don't like that anymore. People want to have their own product, or people are different, so they need a different product. Um, and that's where, where um, injection molding falls short as well. So, uh, and that's where 3D printing may step in. And the last, uh, last example where shorter or smaller production uh, runs are interesting is if you, if you look at localization. So last, um, last five or 10 years, you see really this trend of, of people trying to buy local again. Uh, we have the Vechtal here with, uh, with brilliant products. Um, but you can also imagine that shipping products all over the world is not necessarily the, the best option. For small things like fidget spinners, it's, it's fine. But if you go to, to bigger, more complex shaped products, transportation is actually a very big waste of energy. So if you have production units closer to where you want, actually want to use the product, that's, uh, that's going to save a lot of energy. So those, those are three examples where you may want to have smaller uh, series. And that's where um, uh, uh, 3D printing may step in. Now, and one of the things people always think is that 3D printing is very good for one or two or three 
Now, maybe five parts, but that's it. But that's not the case anymore. There's a lot of technologies out there where you can actually print large number of uh, products. So uh, the there's other technologies, but also our technology. We can uh, fill a bath, and we can make multiple products at the same time. We can actually, at the moment, print eight kilos of product per hour, and we can go up to 25 kilos by the end of this year. So imagine uh, the amount of products you can actually print in an hour. And that goes, that goes relatively qu uh, quick. And the good thing is that we don't have to wait before a mold is finished uh, or before the, uh, the machine is set up. We can start r right away when we have the model finished. And the other thing you see happening is that there's also a lot of intermediates occurring. So uh, what's on the screen here is something I'm very excited about. That's something we did last Friday. Um, this is actually the same injection molding machine, only not with a steel mold anymore. This is a 3D, 3D printed mold. So this is a mold we printed, uh, the blue thing on the top. And we can produce parts in that as well. And the beauty of that is that we don't have to make a, an expensive steel mold. We can make a printed mold, which we can make much quicker, which is much, much less expensive. And we can use it to make maybe two, 3,000 parts. And then, uh, then, then we can see if the product really works. And then in the end, if it really works, we can invest in the steel mold again. This is all done here in Zwolle, so I think that's pretty exciting as well. So the materials were developed in Zwolle, the machine is here de uh, developed in Zwolle, the machine we tested on is available on the Polymer Science Park, so I think there's really cool things happening in this area. So and the last, uh, last thing I want to talk about is geometry. So I think there's uh, a lot to say about um, uh, structural optimization, and that's something that's in, in technical industry that's, that's a hot topic at the moment. But you can see it happening in nature already for millions of years. So if you look at this uh, lampion fruit, lantern fruit, sorry, um, you can actually see the very nice and intricate structure. And now it is possible to make those kind of things with 3D printing as well. And the beauty of that is that we can go to ultimate lightweight structures. So if you look at those cars outside again, uh, they are from, made out of composite materials again, so they are very lightweight already. But it is also very important to understand that the, the, every kilo you save on these cars, um, you're not going to transport it anymore, so it saves energy in the long run. So we're now able to look at nature, take those kind of structures and put it in cars and make them more effective, more efficient. And this is an example uh, where that's, that's actually used. So you can see the 3D printed interior and the exterior we have uh, applied carbon fiber but that's done in a traditional way. So this, again, is this, this integration of current technology with 3D printing technologies to reach really new potential uh, products. And this is, this is something really exciting. So this, um, this is basically what I wanted to show you. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities with 3D printing in combination with um, uh, traditional, uh, traditional methods. I think also the challenge for the designer is no longer choosing between 3D printing or another uh, technology, but it's much more getting towards the point where the designer has to combine various uh, production methods. And that's a very interesting new area in, in product design and product manufacturing. I think 3D printing, uh, as I showed you, can play a role in reducing material waste, making structures more uh, uh, energy efficient, and ju just using less material. And I think you're all sitting relatively comfortable still, so I think those chairs are still, uh, still fine as they are. Cool. Uh, thanks for your, uh, for your attention.